But I do want to talk to you tonight about the glorious Son, Jesus Christ. You know, we're, we're approaching what, to me, is the greatest date on the Christian calendar, and that's Easter. Now, I know Christmas is wonderful, and, and Christmas we celebrate the birth of our Lord, and I know it was necessary through that virgin birth for Him to come. But our salvation would not be here today if it was not for the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the first fruits of all righteousness. And uh, we are celebrating that as it is approaching, and we're looking forward to that glorious time. So we've been sharing on Sunday nights when I'm up here, um, we, we've been sharing on the baptism of the Holy Spirit of God, the action and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And that's what we're going to continue on and in the area of the glorious Son. Now Jesus said that it was expedient that he go away because if he didn't go, the Spirit of truth wouldn't come whom the world cannot receive. But he goes on further to talk about that the Spirit would testify of him. That glory would be given to him. During these early times when God revealed himself to men through the prophets, the revelation had come through individuals and by the power and agency of the Holy Spirit. It's like the Holy Spirit would move upon holy men of God. And they spoke as the Spirit began to give them utterance and direction as far as writing the Word of God. This Word was written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. This isn't a group of men that just got together and decided to pen some words. These are men who were moved by the Holy Spirit of God and wrote down very important things for us. They gave revelation to the future of what is going to come. Now, there are some things that I know that is going to happen because the Scripture reveals them. They're revealed through the Holy Spirit of God. There's some things and insight that I have that goes on in my own life that is revealed to me by the power of the Holy Spirit of the Lord. i never forget a time in my life that I wasn't even where I needed to be with the Lord. I had been in a backslidden state and I'd been running from the Lord. And I'd run just about as far as I could and I needed some help. But there was no help around me. No one that I knew that was able, because I was far away from where family and friends or any of them were, and I just needed some help. I'll never forget what I did. As I was in my car, I rolled over in the passenger seat, knelt down, and I know some of y'all are thinking, how in the world your size could you kneel down? Because I didn't weigh then what I weigh now. I, I, I could just tell you that cards were made bigger then, you know, and there was a lot more room. But I'll never forget as I knelt down and I began to pray. You remember, running from God, far away from where any help was, and I began to pray and I said, God, I need your help. I know I've not been what I needed to be. I know I've not done what I've needed to do. I know I've been running from you, but God, I'm in a desperate place and I need your help. Now, I know some people are going to say, oh, you know, that didn't really happen. God spoke to me that very night. God spoke to my heart while I was on my knees in that old 65 Chevrolet Supersport right there on the side of the road as I talked to God and God spoke to my heart and told me exactly what to do. And you know what I said? I said, Lord, I have already done that and it didn't work. And you know what he said? But you tried it before you called up on me. Go and do it. You know what came to mind and comes to mind right now? Jesus had stood on the edge of the bank and he saw the disciples that were there. And he said, do you have any fish? And I'm paraphrasing. And they said, Lord, we've told all the night and we've caught nothing. And he said, well, just cast over there. 
just cast over. Now listen, they'd probably already cast that whole area. They'd already gone with their nets, dropped through that whole area, and nothing happened. But at the direction of the Lord something started happening. I'm talking about the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Now, what I can say to you is, is I lay down in my vehicle that night and I rested. The next morning, I got up and went and did exactly what God told me to do. Could I tell you that when I first did it, the indication was is nothing's going to happen. But all of a sudden, I saw something change and immediately God did exactly what he told me what he was going to do and exactly what was going to happen, and my need was supplied. Mm -hmm. That is when we are sure the Holy Spirit is witnessing to the glory of the Son, Jesus Christ. Christ. I believe that God, and I know that some people say, you know, that uh, God won't hear your prayers if you're a sinner, and, and I know what the Scripture said, that the Scripture tells us that God is not under any obligation to hear any prayer that you pray until you first pray the prayer of repentance. I know that. But I believe that God sometimes sees an opportunity to change lives and God begins to work as He desires and begins to work on situations to turn people around. And God turned things around for me at that particular time. Now, the Scripture goes on in 2 Peter chapter 1 and 21 begin to relate to us, For the prophecy came not in old times by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. You see, it's the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit of the Lord that it is work there. The focus of the Old Testament is on Christ, that Christ is going to come. In the Old Testament, everything pointed to the fact that Christ is going to come. You can look in the Psalms and you can see that the psalmist wrote about the Messiah, the, the Savior that is coming. You can look into Isaiah in Ezekiel there and you can see that the promise is there, that Emmanuel, a son, is going to be given there, that hope is going to come and life is going to change. Everything pointed to the Son. But something in the New Testament begins to work that once the Son has come to reveal and reflect to us that the fullness of the gospel is about to be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So He came in the New Testament. And as He came as a Son of God into the world that exists here, and, and I often think about that, uh, how difficult that choice might have been for humans to send your son, your only begotten, who is with you from the foundation of the world, into a hostile world that you know they're going to be mistreated, you know they're going to be rejected, and you know that eventually they're going to kill your son. How hard that would be for us. Now think about the compassion of our father and his son, and the Holy Spirit of God that went through this entire plan and knew that it was a flawless plan. Can, can I tell you that salvation is a flawless plan? There's no flaws in it. I, I've heard people talk about the inconsistencies in the Word. There's no inconsistencies in the Word. I've heard people talk about, you know, that, that it's flawed. It's not flawed. If anything is flawed, it's our way of thinking. You see, God's Word is holy. It is righteous. It is pure. So he came into the world and, and that decision to send him into the world had to be hard. But he did it because he thought about you and I. That we had no help and no hope without him. i never forget on that night that I knelt down in that old car on the side of the road and prayed a prayer to God and ask him for help that he thought about me way back before he ever died on Calvary. He thought about Billy Boatwright's going to need me and he looked at the date that was there and said that's the date he's going to need me and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to appropriate everything he needs. Could I just remind you here this evening 
that God has appropriated for you everything you will need in life to sustain you and keep you and to protect you and to direct you. That's what his love is for you and for I and what he is doing. And the beginning at Moses, as you begin there, and all the prophets, he expounded unto them the scriptures of the things concerning himself. Jesus did while he was here. You've got to remember, he went back to where Moses wrote these things. Now, you say, well, what did Moses write? Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. It's called the Pentateuch. He wrote those five books there of the Bible, and uh, we have those still with us today. They are studied, they are taught from, they are read daily, and, and they, they really give insight to us. And you say, well, how did he know about all the things from the beginning? Um, is there anybody here that can tell me what your grandmother's name is? Okay, Lucille. Okay, does anybody here can tell me what your great-grandmother's name is? Oh, see, anybody here can tell me what your great-great-grandmother's name is? Okay, so if you want to know who they are, what are you going to do? You're going to go to somebody that remembered them. And you're going to ask the question. You're either going to go to Brother Zatter or Sister Billy, and you're going to ask them a question, aren't you, Donna? And you're going to say, can you tell me who your great-grandmother was? And they say, oh, yeah, I can remember my great-grandmother. Yeah. You see, we have things passed on to us from our forefathers before them. I i never forget this. You know, I think about myself a lot when I start looking at this scriptures and relating this. My dad lived to be an old man. He was nearly 92 years old. My dad was born in 1914. Much of his family lived for many years. They were old people when they died. You know, uh, I don't know. I, I Sometimes I've been surprised I've lived as long as I have lived, you know. Uh, but uh, I plan on living for eternity, in case you, you wonder. And you say, you plan on living here forever? I didn't say here. I plan on living for eternity. It may not be here, but my plan is to live eternally in the presence of God that is there. One of the things I think about is my dad was an old man and left us a lot of information. Because he remembered his ancestors before him. Could I tell you tonight that if I chose to, I could tell you a particular story of my great, 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 great ancestors and events that took place and could even begin to share some dates and time frame that dates back to the Civil War. You see, I didn't live in those days. You say, how do you know that? Because it was passed on to me, the story, from my father down to me, from his father to him, and from his father to him. It was passed on through every one of them. And so we have memory. So what happens where Moses is concerned? Moses had a direct line back to what was going on. He talked to his forefathers before him of the information. He had it that was there. But it wasn't enough that he had knowledge and reports from them. He needed confirmation of the Holy Spirit of God. And the Holy Spirit of God moved upon him and gave confirmation to that and he knew that what he was writing down was holy words of God and they were pointing to Jesus and his coming so you see when you go way back in the Old Testament you'll find that Jesus was predicted to come you say well how could they know so much about the son because before the world began as we know it and we have information he was with the Father. You remember the very beginning of the words in Scripture when he talked about man? He said, let us, plural, make man, plural, in our own image. He's talking about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You say, well, is that all you got to go on? Oh, no. Jesus said before Abraham was, I am. They got all upset with him. 
because he was saying to them that he was before their father Abraham. But when you begin to understand the scriptures, you understand who Jesus is, what Jesus did, this glorious Savior of ours, the Holy Spirit working in him. Later, Jesus spoke there to all of the apostles and, and he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be full, fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures uh, and said unto them, Thus it is written. Now, I want to go over to the book of Luke in chapter 24. And I want to start there with verse 44, and I want to read here. I'm talking about this glorious Son of God that is here. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled. And he goes on, as the scriptures I just quoted to you and shared with you, whenever he began to say, which are written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and the Psalms concerning me, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Get this. And he said unto them, thus it is written and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that the resurrection and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem and ye are witnesses of these things and behold I send the promise of my father upon you but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high he's sending us a message here the power comes through Christ Christ comes to us in the form and in the presence of the power of of the Holy Spirit of God. What God does today, He does through His Spirit. Think about what I'm about to tell you. When Jesus was trying to get them to understand the importance of the Holy Spirit in the last days, He said, if you speak against the Father and repent, it'll be forgiven you. If you speak against the Son and repent, it'll be forgiven you. But to blaspheme against the Holy Spirit of God, there's no forgiveness. What he's saying is, is he's with you right now. You don't need to reject him. You do not need to speak against him. You need to be open and submissive to what the Holy Spirit is doing for you in your particular life. i got to hurry. So we begin to see that Jesus is doing these great and these mighty things that are here. In Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 3, you can go and read it there, is he begins to talk about the majesty that is on high. Jesus had stated that he was not seeking his own glory, but the glory of his Father which is in heaven. But he goes on to say that when I am departed, one will testify or one will glorify me. Now, what is the job of the Holy Spirit? To glorify the Son. To glorify the Son. That's why the Scripture goes on to tell us that no man that has the Spirit of God in him can say that Jesus Christ is accursed. And no one without the Spirit of God can say that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You got to know that within your heart. You got to understand the fullness of that and what God is doing in and through the work of the kingdom of the Lord there. He said, My Father, whom you claim is your God, is the one who glorifies me in the book of John, chapter 8, there. He's talking about the, the Father that will glorify the Son. Why is it that we are told to give glory unto Jesus Christ? Because we're instructed by the Father. Jesus is the one that died for my sins. He is the one that saved my soul. What accounts for the preeminence of Christ that the Father would give glory of Him? Why the Father and the Holy Spirit both give glory unto the Son? you got to go to the cross to begin with. It's the cross. It's the cross. You want to have revival, you got to get to the cross. You want to have the, the power of God to be in manifest in your life, you got to get to the cross. 
You want to have some strength within your soul, you got to get to the cross. It's everything is there at the cross. Why? Because at the cross is where the revealing of the salvation of mankind comes through the shedding of the blood. It is there that Jesus paid the ultimate price for you and I that we could have salvation. It starts at the cross because the cross is important to what we do in the kingdom of God. After his triumph entry into Jerusalem, Jesus began begin to make frequent references to his glorification. He is talking about he will be glorified in the Father. The Father will raise him up. It even says to us, he said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to me. Speaking about the power of God lifting him up in the work of the kingdom that is there. First, it was to make or to bring glory to the Father is what Jesus did. First, that's what he did at the cross. He said, I came to do the will of my Father which has sent me. In other words, he didn't come and trying to lift up himself. He came to lift up the Father. He came to glorify the Father. You remember the words he said? He said, hitherfore have ye asked nothing in my name, but since I'm doing what I'm doing from this day forward, you'll pray directly to the Father in my name. He's talking about the Holy Spirit of God, the working of the kingdom that is there. Secondly, it was, to glo- it, it was a glory related to his death. On the cross, he gives glory to the Father. Secondly, it brings glory to his death. You know, they got upset at Jesus because Jesus said, unless you drink of my blood and eat, of my flesh, you can't get into the eternity of kingdom, of heaven. You can't get to heaven. Well, they thought, well, who is this that says we got to drink his blood and eat his flesh? Now, what he's speaking of is we've got to be partakers of Christ's death, his burial, and his resurrection. We're about to celebrate his resurrection. The next few weeks, we're going to be talking about that. We're going to be moving forward. And on Easter, we're looking for a great and grand and glorious time of celebration. But you know what I was thinking? I may not celebrate Easter on this earth. The rapture of the church might just take place before then. It's about giving glory to God in the day where we live. Jesus announced the hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. He's talking about when he's giving up the ghost, he's dying that is there. It is there that he is surrendering his life for our sakes. I've often said it was not nails that held him to the cross. It was not demons that held him to the cross. But it was his desire to please his Father and his love for you and I that held him to the cross. That's why he stayed on the cross. Could I tell you according to what the scriptures relate to us, at any time through the process of him being upon this earth, he could have called to the Father and said, I've had enough. It's enough to take me home. And legions of angels would have come down and gathered him up, and and there would have been no shame but he was willing to go to the ultimate end for you and I. You know, question I'd like for you to think about, why do we give up on God so easy? Why do we turn from him in such simple manners? I mean, he really paid a high price for us. He really paid a high price for me to get my deliverance. Why, Why would we doubt him so much? Why would we not call... Now, you know, I, I'm one of those that I just have to tell you, I've probably failed God more than most folks in this world. I've probably repented more than most people have. I really have. But there's one thing that I have to say is God knows I love Him. And every time I've ever failed God, I've been ashamed of myself for being weak and frail and giving in when I should have stood firm. And I've asked him to forgive me time and time again in my life for that. 
And the beauty of who God is, He has always forgiven me when I've come to Him with a sincere heart. The Bible said He will in no wise cast you out as you call upon Him. Christ's glory is also related to the completion of His redemptive work and return to the Father. When He states, Father, the hour is come. Glorify Thy Son that Thy Son also may glorify Thee. I have glorified Thee on the earth. I have finished the work which Thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify Thy me in thine own self and with thy, with thy glory which I had with thee uh, before the world began. And so what he is saying is, is, just put me back where I was with you before. Put me back where I was. Jesus had his disciples to come to him uh, wanting to understand more about the kingdom and wanted to be real close to him. And they came requesting, Lord, just permit that one of us be on your right hand and one on your left. And they were thinking Jesus is the one that is there. He, he's all there is because he was all there was to them. And truly he is all we need because in him is the Father and the Son. What that means is that there are three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that make up God, that makes up who God is. And Jesus said to them, his disciples, he said, it's, an, it's a great thing you ask, a hard thing, for you to be able to go where I'm going, face what I'm faced with. But to... Those that will sit at my right hand and my left is not for me to give. That's already determined. You know why he had to say that? Because he was going back to sit at the right hand of the Father. He was going back where he was from the foundation of the world. Could I tell you where he is at the, today? He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. He is sitting there right now waiting for you and I. He is watching there and the Holy Spirit is working upon the earth and orchestrating everything. You, you know what caused us to have the kind of service we had this morning? You know why that, that just simple obedience to putting this chair here in this place brought about such a move of God? It was the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God at work in our lives. Don't underestimate the power of faith and obedience to God in the power of the Spirit of the Lord. God ever told you to go do something and you kind of hum-hauled around? Mm-hmm. I've done that a few times. Sure have. God told me to go do it. I, I, you know, I, I've even left the house intending to go do it and get down the road and talk myself out of it. Oh, yeah. Of course, I had a little help. There was that little imp that was sitting on my shoulder, you know, trying to tell me that, that oh, you know, you, you're going to embarrass yourself. You know, you, you don't need to do that. And the whole time God's saying, you know, I've told you what to do. If you'll just obey God. Let me, let me tell you what, it can be as simple as a phone call. A phone call. A phone call. I'll never forget this, and, and I'm going to come to a close because I'm talking about the power of the Holy Spirit of the Lord. But I'm going to give you this testimony. I, I'll never forget. You, most of you have heard me say this before, but uh, I was pastoring at a, at a place where I'd, I'd really had gone through a tremendous struggle, and uh, it was one of the most difficult pastorates I ever had, not because the people were bad. There, there were good people, loving people. They, they had been hurt and broken, and the church had gone through a split, uh, not with the pastor before me, but with the one before him. In fact, the pastor I followed uh, that was there nearly had a nervous breakdown himself because of the things that he dealt with and the lingering things that were going on. And, and, and he vowed that he'd never again get close to people. And so the next church he went to, he struggled with because he, he just didn't want to allow people to get close to him. But it was, a, it was a hard place for me because the church's finances were horrible. It's a place where I spent every bit of my savings just to 
live there. It was at a place to where I became sick and my family became sick and, and, and we struggled. It was a place to where I saw outpourings of the Holy Spirit of God and demonstrations of the Lord in a most powerful way, but financially it was a real struggle that was there. There, there was a, a time that uh, the event was going on at the church and just up on the hill where the parsonage was that uh, I was in. My family was down below the hill there in church and I was in the bed sick as I could be praying. And the church was down under the hill praying for me because I was so sick. Didn't have the money to go to a doctor. Struggled. Did, didn't have money to even buy groceries other than continuously digging into all my savings. And it was all gone. It was all gone. And then I, I just talked to God and I said, God, I said, Lord, I, I know because this is a place where Overseer asked me seven times to go before I went. Because I kept telling him no, no, no. But when I got there and, and, and all of the deterioration began to happen and everything was going on. Spiritually, it was powerful. But everything, it seemed like I tried to do. First time in my life, I, I decided I'd go get a job and, and go to work because I, I needed to take care of my family. And, and when I did everything that I could and I went and talked to the guy and, and, and he said, look, we're going to hire you, Billy. He called me and said, we're going to hire you. We've checked your, um, your references and uh, we're going to hire you. And then a week later, when I talked to him, he told me, he said, he said, the door's been closed. I can't hire you. He said, because someone else within the company is going to move up and take that position, and they won't let me hire you for a lesser job because they say that you're overqualified and you'll never be happy. It was then that I understood God was closing doors to me. You say, God closing doors to you? Oh, yeah. You know, sometimes God's got to get you down really low before he can raise you up to what he wants you to be. I, I'd reached an all-time low that night. I'll never forget, I crawled out of the bed. On the edge of the bed, I made an altar before God, and I called upon the name of the Lord and said, God, I don't really understand why I'm going through what I am, but I know, God, that you've closed doors to me for a reason. So, Lord, if it's something that I have done or not done, I'm asking you, Lord, to show me that I can fix it. But, God, if this is a test you're putting me through, then, Lord, just put me through it, but bring me out victorious on the other end. Then I heard the voice of God speak to me, and you know what he said? He said, I want you to get up, and I want you to call a friend of yours in Mobile. And I want you to tell him that in prayer as you were praying that I spoke to your heart and I told you to call. So I prayed a little bit. I got up sick. I got up and made the phone call. On the other end, he said, uh, hello. And I told him who I was. And he said, oh, Brother Billy. And... And then a door opened on the other side. He said, hold on a minute, Brother Billy. And then he got back on the phone and we talked just a second. He said, Brother Billy, when I told him, I said, God told me to call you and to tell you this. He said, you know, when you called and the phone rang and the door opened, he said, my wife is sick as she can be and she's been diagnosed with cancer and she's been sick and not able to go. He said, but when you called and you and I finished our greeting, she said she opened the door and she said, Paul, somebody has touched God for me. Well, you know, we finished our conversation and I got down on my knees and I just lifted hands and I started praising God and then God really started talking to me. Could I tell you what he said? He said, from this day forward, Billy, as long as you obey me, you will never again have to worry about your finances. He had shut every door to me to prove to me that he was God. Could I tell you that suddenly God started opening doors? Amazingly, things started 
going forward in the power and the grace of God. So you see, people have come way too late to tell me God can't talk to you in the power of the Holy Spirit of the Lord. Could I tell you that's been over 30 years ago when God stood true to His Word ever since that day? Amen. Could I tell you my God is a faithful God? Could I tell you that my God takes care of me and my God takes care of all my needs according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus? I'm going to leave you with one other note for you to remember this. Not only did God make a promise to me, but every church that I went to after I left that church, every church that I pastored from that day forward when I got there, not because of me, but because of the promise of God, the finances of that local church started rising. Every time. You know what I said? Well, God blessed His people so His people could bless me. Amen. You got to understand, if God's going to bless me, He blesses me through the work of the kingdom in how He brings things to pass. I've seen it happen time and time again. How great is God? How powerful is He? The power of the Holy Spirit of God. I want you to stand with me. You see, I don't know what you might be going through. I don't know where you might be going through a struggle. See, I'm one of those that I know what it is not to be able to have food for the family like you really want. What I didn't tell you, that when God started opening the doors, I went to the door when it was knocked on, and there was a van sitting out in front of the vehicle, and there was a church, not even the church I pastored, but one down the road that knew nothing at all about what I was going through, walked up to the door and said, Pastor, we hope we're not offending you, but... We have a van full of boxed food that we have been instructed by the Lord to deliver to your home. Mm -hmm. You think God doesn't know and understand where we are? Could I tell you that God started opening the doors for my family and their health and everything? How great is God? He's great. He's great. You see, I don't know what your needs might be, but you see, this morning... When we got here in this chair, all heaven just kind of came down. Lots of people were prayed for in this chair. And I just said, we'll leave it here tonight. So if you're here tonight and you need God to do something in your life, it may be you, it may be your family, it may be a situation that is beyond you, and you want God's help in that need, I want you to come and I want you to sit here in this chair. And we're going to have some people gather around and we're going to begin to pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I need some prayer warriors here. Come on, guys. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hey, would you put a little bit of oil on your finger here and put it right on his head? Hallelujah.